So, Father, we come before you today. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you, God, that you're able to transform us by your word. It's sharp. It's, it's living. It's powerful. It's able to transform us. It's a supernatural word, and we thank you for it. Change our hearts. Change our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 So, I want to say this. We have a baptism service coming up uh, next Saturday, so I wanted to talk a bit about baptism and what baptism is, uh, scripturally. So, there's three types of baptism. Scripturally, we're looking at the number. The first one I want to look at is the baptism of John. Can you say baptism of John? Okay. And then the second one is Christian baptism. And the third one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Starting with the first one, uh, well, first of all, baptiz- the word baptism comes from the Greek word baptismo, right? Or uh, it means to fully immerse. Uh, to baptize all of you, okay? It's to get fully wet, to immerse. And I want to say this. Uh, it's important to understand when we get baptized, we're making a decision to be fully immersed in the lifestyle of Christ. You're, you're making a decision to be fully immersed as disciples of Christ. See, here's the issue. Um, God did not send us into the world to make church members. He sent us into all the world to make disciples okay so the most important thing whether you're sprinkled or whether you're dunked is to understand this you're fully immersed in your commitment to christ amen and that's been such a big debate whether whether you should be dunked or whether you should be sprinkled and personally i believe you should be fully immersed but the issue is the understanding that you're fully in say fully in and so god wants us to be fully in all right um, but the biggest thing about understanding baptism is you're moving out of one thing into another thing. All right, you're moving from one thing to another thing, and there's there's two or three prepositions we see uh, in in the whole concept of baptism, and that's in and into. Can you say that with me? Say in and into. And so so this refers to the elements that you're immersed in. For for example, the element of water, you're immersed in water right? You're immersed in the presence of God. When you're being baptized, you're in an element, okay? And the word into talks about what you're moving into. Does that make sense? Okay? What is the end product, okay? So the result of being immersed, okay, it's, it's what you're passing into. There's a new life. There's a new change, okay? And so John, John's baptism was in water, into repentance. So this is what John's baptism was about. And it was for the forgiveness of sins. Now let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 2 to 5. It says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. And so John was coming before the face of Jesus, who will prepare your way before you. Okay? Let's go to the next verse. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight okay so john came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance do you see that for the remission of sins so john's baptism into repentance john's baptism was into forgiveness of sins and so we see this in john chapter oh, we see it in the, the, all the gospels we see it but john was at the end of a certain dispensation of the law Okay, there, there was a dispensation time period of the law and the prophets, and he came at the very end, and he was very important. Jesus said he was more important than any of the other pro- the products or uh, the, the prophets because of what he was doing. He was transitioning from the law and the prophets to grace and truth. There was a new transition time coming. So, so John the Baptist came, and he was preparing people for the Lord. It says in verse 5, Then all the land of Judah and all those from Jerusalem went out to him, and they were all baptized by John in the Jordan River confessing their sins. Okay? And so you need to understand something here. Um, It it says here, they all went out, okay, to him and all were baptized by him. So they, you know, they speculate probably 150,000 people went out and they were baptized into the baptism of repentance to prepare the way of the Lord. Okay? And so, this is important because uh, there's three things that, well, first of all, there's a spiritual principle here. How many know in the book of James it says that, it, you know, God gives, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen? 
And so in order for God to send grace, how many know Jesus is, represents grace? In order to send his beloved son into the world to minister, he had to first of all have a humble people who were coming with repentant hearts. So that's why Judah and Jerusalem were led out into the wilderness. They repented for their sins to prepare the way for grace. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. One of the messages we miss today in the church is the message of repentance. You cannot even, you cannot even receive the grace of God unless you understand where the line is. And that's why Joshua said, he, see, he drew a line in the sand and he said, you know what? He said, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house... We're going to serve the Lord. And so the enemy wants us to remove the line so we can say, well, it's all about grace and it's all about the love of God, which it is. But the reality is there's a line in the sand. How many hear what I'm saying? And when we come to a place where we realize that some things are wrong and some things are right. Truth isn't relative. The Bible tells us what truth is. And when we recognize and we repent, grace comes. How many hear what I'm saying this morning? And so there's three things that John required to be baptized unto repentance. Number one, he demanded repentance. Okay? Repentance means to prepare your heart for grace. And repentance is to turn around, to change your mind, and go in a different direction. And you know, sometimes people come, and I've seen this in the past, where they start crying, and they're really sorrowful, and say, you know, I, I feel really bad, and God, I'm so sorry. I mean, it's an emotional thing. And then they fall back into the same thing over and over again. How many know what I'm talking about? And other times you come someone who's not emotional, they come to the front, and they say, you know, I was wrong. God, forgive me. I'm going to change my direction. I'm going to do it your way. And you sit there, and you go, that wasn't very sincere. But that person ends up staying true. Why? Because it's not an emotion. It's a decision. When you make a decision, repent means to turn and go 180 degrees, change your mind and say, I'm going to do things God's way. I'm not going to... And sometimes repentance can be emotional, but it's not about emotion. Amen? So we have to make a decision. And so John demanded repentance. And, you know, number two, he demanded the public confession of sin. All right? You have to be willing. The Bible says in the New Testament, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. How many know you're in a relationship with God? Amen. And so when you mess up, you come boldly to the throne room of grace to obtain mercy, and you confess your sins, and he's faithful. But we have to go to him. You know, we got Christians, got the, the, you know, the, the enemy's working in their life because they've got sin in their life. They haven't even bothered confessing for and they say, it's all under grace. And they haven't come to the Lord and say, Lord, I was wrong. I violated our relationship. Please forgive me. And they, they, they don't deal with their sin. And there's no promise in Scripture that says you're going to be forgiven unless you come and confess. You hear what I'm saying? So confession is so important. He demanded a confession. And number three, um, he demanded evidence of a changed life. So John the Baptist said to the Pharisees when they came, they said, he said, who warned you guys? to flee from the coming judgment. And he started to say, show fruits of repentance. I want to see a changed life, and then I'll baptize you. How, how many know what I'm saying? So this was, this was the baptism of repentance. Say baptism of repentance. Baptism of repentance. But baptism, John's baptism, could only take people so far. It couldn't take them to a transformed life. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, uh, it says here, Assuredly I say to you, just as Jesus speaking, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist was not born of the Spirit of God. He was not born again. He, he, he knew how to prepare his heart for the coming of the Lord, but the Lord was not able to transform him because he had not been born again. How, how many see that? But you, how many here, you're born again. You're born of the Spirit of God. And the Bible says that, in, in a sense, you're greater than John the Baptist because you're born of God. Amen. It's an awesome truth. Hard to get. Okay? And after Pentecost, after Jesus rose from the dead, John's baptism was no longer valid. We're going to move into a, sep, a, sec, a second type of baptism. In Acts chapter 19, verse 19, it says this. And after... It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. 
And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I think as Christians, man, maybe we should ask that question to people once in a while. Hey, you're a Christian. You believe in God. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? Because when you receive the Holy Spirit, there's a transformation that takes place. When I received the Holy Spirit, I, I, I literally tell you, one night I was watching R-rated movies. The next day I, I, I was saved and I couldn't watch the garbage anymore. Why? I was transformed. Why? Because I received the Holy Spirit. If your life hasn't changed, if your conscience isn't, you know, is still seared, if you can still live a lifestyle of sin, you probably haven't met the Holy Ghost. And so, this is, so, so look what he says here. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We've not even so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, and here's the word, into what were you baptized? Remember, baptism means into, right? What were you baptized into? And they said to him, we were baptized into John's baptism. And then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who comes after him, that is on Christ Jesus. If they, were, if they believed, they would have been baptized. And here's the thing. If they would have believed, or if they would have heard the gospel of Christ, they would have been baptized into Christ. Because the great commission was to go into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they hadn't heard the message. They would have said, yeah, yeah, yeah. They talked about the Holy Spirit when they dunked us. But they said, who is the Holy Spirit? They didn't understand the concept of new birth. Okay? You see that? So Christian baptism is not a baptism of repentance. I'll say that again. Christian baptism is not a baptism of repentance. Because Jesus had no sin. And when we're baptized into Christ, we've already dealt with our sin. Look, look at this in Matthew chapter two, 3, verse 13 to 17. This is when Jesus was being baptized. And Jesus went from Galilee to Jordan, to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. He said, I'm the one who needs to baptize you. And I want you to see this, that John wasn't sure if Jesus was even the Messiah, because afterwards... Until he saw the Spirit of the Lord descend upon him and say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He didn't say, This is the Messiah. He just knew he was a cousin of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. And he said, Jesus, man, I've I seen your Instagram and how you talk and how you live. Your Facebook page. I mean, you're a righteous guy. You, you know, I, I need to repent. You need to baptize me because your life is pure and holy. You're a prophet of God. You're, you're a pure man. And, and, and you, wanna, you want me to baptize you? And he said, why, why are you coming to me, Jesus? I know you're a good guy. You're holier than I am. And then verse 15, but Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires, okay? All right, to fulfill all righteousness. So John agreed to baptize him. And so Jesus had no sin to be baptized of, but he had to be obedient in the act of submerging and, and we got to be obedient. It's a command. Be baptized. Right? Amen? Amen. And so, um, here's the thing we need to understand. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says here, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved by faith in the finished work of the cross. Not of works, lest any man shall boast. And so Jesus was saying, you know, I don't have sin, but I need to be baptized in obedience to God to require, because it's a requirement of God. One of the first commands we're given as disciples uh, of Christ when we get saved is to be baptized. Amen? So let's, let's move on. All right. So Christian baptism is not a baptism of repentance. It really isn't. It's how we identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. It's basically a funeral service. It's basically you're saying to the spirit realm and all around you, listen, I've died with Christ. And you're making a public confession and you're in obedience to God. And water baptism is so important. Amen? Amen. I know you're all going to sign up and we'll be dunking all of you guys, right? Get you baptized on Saturday. I was baptized a few times because as a, not, not that you have to, you just get baptized once, but 
every time I get a revelation, I'm just like, I want to do it again. <laughs> because it's just so powerful, right? Um, anyway. So, um, Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ... See, when we're getting baptized in water, it's not into repentance, it's into Christ. You see that? We were baptized also into what? His death. And then into his resurrection. There's so much power in what takes place symbolically. All right? When it talks about being baptized into death, it means we're coming to the end of our own strength. It's no longer I who lives. It's no longer about my life and what I want. It's about Christ. When I come out, I'm going to come out in newness of life. The Spirit of God's going to descend upon me like a dove, figuratively speaking. And I'm going to be empowered to walk in the resurrection power of Christ. I'm no longer going to strive with sin because God's power is going to enable me to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's an empowerment of God that comes upon you. And this is what it symbolizes. And you have to go into the waters of baptism by faith. If you don't go in by faith, you go in a dry sinner, you come out a wet sinner. If you go in by faith, it's transforming. you got to believe. And the problem is, you know, so many churches have done this where it's like you do a five or six week class on baptism and explain all the details and, and they still haven't had a heart transformation. They go into the waters of baptism, not in faith. You hear what I'm saying? It's a faith thing. It's not an information thing. It's a faith thing. Okay? Um, so anyway, let's move on. You guys all right? Amen. We're good. Okay. A lot of scriptures, but I, I just want to hit the... So we understand it. Okay? So when we resurrect, we go down. And we're buried with Christ. We come up in newness of life. We come up with the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not being baptized into church membership. That's not biblical. You're, you're baptized. You come into the kingdom of God, into the family of God, into discipleship with God. And so here's the requirements for Christian baptism. Number one, you must believe the gospel. You have to understand that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. That's, that's the requirement. You need to say, hey, I'm okay with it. I believe that message. and I'm going to be baptized and commit my life to the Lord. Number two, you must have repentance. You have to. And there's been times where I've had people come to me and they want to get baptized and they're practicing sin. Okay? Now, how many know sometimes we fall into sin, we make mistakes, right? It doesn't mean you lose your salvation because you, you've... See, when, when Noah was inside of the ark, floating around, when he fell over, he didn't fall out of the ark. He stayed in the ark. How many hear what I'm saying? He was secure in the ark. We're secure in Christ if you fall. But if you practice sin... And so I've had people come to me and I know they're like living with their girlfriend or living with their boyfriend or they have, and, and they're just like, I'm okay with that. Well, I'm not okay with baptizing you because this is supposed to be a sign of what God has done in your life. There must be repentance. Uh, how many hear what I'm saying? So, you know, people can think I'm legalistic, but the reality is this, you must repent. How many hear what I'm saying? Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, when Peter said to them, repent. And then let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's three full things. You repent, you get baptized, and then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Very simple. Okay? So number one, you must believe the gospel. Number two, you must repent. And number three, you must believe the gospel. Twice. It's all by faith. Okay? Okay? Uh, and number four, you must have a good conscience. Here's another one in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. Those who were formerly disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Okay, next verse. There is also an antitype which now saves us, which is baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we see this example in Scripture, all right, that God wants us to have a good conscience. 
And, and there's nothing, nothing better than when all of a sudden you don't feel guilt anymore. You feel cleansed. You feel like you've been washed from your past. And I don't think it's healthy as Christians if you're walking around feeling condemned and feeling dirty. You need, you need to repent, and he's faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you, and then you can walk in victory. Any voice that comes to you that doesn't sound like a mother or father talking to a son or daughter is probably the enemy. It's called condemnation. Coming to say there's something wrong with you. You know? And so, baptism is very important. And I don't think it has to take a long time. Right? Well, let's look at a couple of scriptures here. You know, we, we understand in Acts chapter 241, we understand that 3,000 souls were added to the Lord in one day. And it says here that they were baptized, and it was that same day they were baptized. No five-week course. No, you know, let's, let's train you and make sure you understand everything. No, they said, do you believe? Yeah, you believe? Okay, let's get you baptized. It's part of the salvation experience. And as, as the church, what we do is we, we come up with this thing called the salvation prayer, and we call people up. And I'm not against the salvation prayer, and we, ha we lead them through a prayer. We don't really check to see if they really believe what they're saying, but we lead them through a prayer. And then we say, okay, come to our church for six months, and then we ask them if they want to get baptized. Well, that's not even scriptural. Anyone hearing what I'm saying here? Okay, because I want to come back to the Word of God. What does the Bible say, okay? Let's look at what the Bible says, okay? Um, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 48. When Peter was still speaking the words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard it, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as, as many as came to Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. They thought, hey, this thing's only for us. For they heard them speaking with tongues and magnifying God. And then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them, he didn't just say suggested, he commanded them, be baptized. <laughs> it's right here. In the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay a few days. So this was happening really, really quickly. There was no delay. Amen. And, and so we understand when Paul and Silas were in prison, they were praising God. How many know all the prisoners were listening? And then God shook, the heavens shook, and the prison shook, and the shackles came off, and they were free, and they were gonna, about to leave. And, the, and, and, and the, the jail guard realized, listen, if I lose one prisoner, back in those days, if you lost a prisoner, you had to give your life. They would take your life. You'd be executed. And Paul said, hey, don't worry, we're going to hang out. We're not leaving. We're all here. Don't kill yourself. And then, then, then the prisoner gets saved, right? And, and his life is totally transformed. And his family was saved. In Acts chapter 16, verse 29 to 33, I'm just going to read it. And then he called for a light. He ran and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. This is the prison guard. And, and he, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Peter said, You must say a sinner's prayer. And then you must attend our church for six months. We have a six-week baptismal course that you must take. And when you've answered all the questions correctly, and I'm sure that you have proven that there's fruit in your life, then I will baptize you. Is that what it says? Okay. Well, we'll see. Let's see what the Bible says. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. So many times people leave this out. You and your household. If, if you get saved, you have the power to begin to pray all of your household into the kingdom. And God will move heaven and earth to save your family because there's, there's a covering that comes. Amen? Because now you're joined here with Christ and you're able to call in your family. I love this. Okay? So believe in the, the, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately, say immediately, he and his family were baptized. We should do that. We should get a big tank up here. We'll have people come and they say, do you, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe he died? Yes, I do. I'm going to dunk you. I'm going to hold you under until you repent of all your sins. <laughs> and then I'll let you up. No, I won't do that. But here's, here's the thing, baptism, how many see the importance of baptism in Scripture? It was immediately tied to your salvation experience. And, you know, that's why it's so important that, you know, we understand this. Baptism comes immediately 
And I'm going to talk about why I think it's so important in this next passage of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers, our ancestors, were under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, when it says you're baptized into Moses, it means you're coming into or under the leadership of Moses. They were under the leadership of Moses. We're baptized into Christ because we're under the leadership of Christ. Very simple. Okay? They were all baptized into Moses. And I want you to understand this, is when the children of the Hebrews were in Egypt, they were under bondage, the Egyptians and the pharaohs, and they, they, they were slaves to Egypt. How many know that? Any, anyone saw the Ten Commandments? Okay. So they had to build their cities, and they had to take care of, they were slaves in Egypt. And before they left, there was this Passover where they came and they put blood on the doorposts of the house so the spirit of death could not come because the blood covers sin. So they were, they were forgiven, and they came out pure. And, but, but here's the thing. They were not set free from their bondage because of the blood. They were forgiven by the blood. They were set free from their bondage in baptism. And as they came out, they were forgiven. But the, the enemy of God, the, 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 the Pharaoh and all his troops and soldiers, they followed the children of the Hebrews. They followed them into the Red Sea. How many know the story? And God parted as, as Moses lifted his hands, the, the seas parted. As Jesus lifted his hands on the cross, the seas parted so we could go into new life. And this is what happened. is the sea parted. The children of Israel went back. They looked back and they watched their captive, captivators, whatever you call them, get buried in the sea. And when you get baptized, you go into the waters, and when you come up, whatever is demonic, whatever addictions you have, whatever is holding you captive is broken. And I know when I was water baptized, they took time and they explained that to me. Listen, this is symbolic. When you go into the water, you've been forgiven your sins, but you come up, you don't have to be addicted to cigarettes anymore. And the world says, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You can go under that water and come up and never have a, uh, never have a taste for that again. Because God will deliver you from what the enemy has set you free from. Amen? You can go in in bondage and have sickness in your body, and you can come up and be healed. Amen? You're coming up in newness of life. So baptism has power when you understand. What we're going to do on Saturday, for some of you who are getting baptized, we're going to have our prayer team meet with you for about half an hour and say hey what do you believe in God for and we're going to pray with you and when you come out of those baptism waters you're going to be delivered you're going to be free and you're going to reign in newness of life amen now here's uh let's look at another passage uh, a scripture here Romans chapter 6 verse 3 to 6 or do you not know many times when we see that in scripture do you not know usually we don't um that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him into baptism, into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. There's a transformed life. Okay? Because if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certain we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ, that in the body that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. See, the Hebrews were slaves to Egypt, but now they can no longer be slaves to Egypt, and that's probably one of the reasons why they were always complaining. Let's go back to Egypt. Take us back to Egypt because there was no no one left to control them. They got buried, right? And, and, and so here's the thing. You don't have to walk as a slave to sin anymore. You'll be tempted. You'll have trials and all these things will come. But you don't have to be a slave. Can I hear an amen? amen. Okay. Why? Verse 6 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. You're in Christ. And I gave this example before. Tony Stark is, has no power or ability, but when he gets in that Iron Man suit, he becomes invincible. And so there was one of the movies, I forget, where he actually got out of his suit and his suit went dead and he had to drag it across. I don't know which movie that was. And he had to drag the suit. 
And many people are dragging around Christ. They're dragging around religion. They're dragging around the word, but they're not in Christ. Stay in Christ, you'll have the power. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Stay in Christ, and you'll have power to overcome all the works of the enemy. Amen? God is good. Well, one more verse, Hebrews chapter eleven twenty nine. 29. It says, by faith, say by faith. And this was in the Old Testament. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. If you have faith in the commandment, in obedience to water baptism, you can believe God that when you go down, whatever's demonic in your life, whatever's oppressing you, has to stay in those waters. And I've seen people get water baptized and get totally set free. And unfortunately, in the church today, we have so many people that need deliverance, that need help. And, and I really believe it's because they've missed something. And that is, number one, repentance. Right. Repent. And when you get water baptized in faith in the finished work of the cross, you're going to come up in newness of life, empowered for victory. Right. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. When you came to Christ... You were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. Right? And with him, you were raised to newness of life because why? Because you trusted the mighty power of God. And nobody talks about the power of God. And so when you go into water baptism, you have to go in saying, I, I, I believe that, that just as Christ died and, and the Spirit of God raised him, he didn't raise himself, the Spirit of God raised him from the dead, that when I come up, the Spirit of the mighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to descend upon me and deliver me, and I'm going to walk in newness of life. Amen. And it's that kind of faith that will destroy the enemies of your God in your life. It's faith. When, when the ten spies went out, only two came back with a good confession. How many know that story? And they went into the promised land. They realized there was giants in, in the land and that they said, there's no way we can do this. They came back and they murmured and complained. There's no way. Uh, there's no way we can get free. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. And two men, do you know who they were? Caleb and Joshua. Said, we are able to because our God is with us. And so when you get saved and you go into the water of baptism, you come out and you're like, oh, I'm, so, I'm addicted to this and I'm struggling with porn and I have a problem with, you know, uh, you know, anger all the time. Why don't, instead of talking about that, why don't you be like the two spies and say, when we go down, we come up free. Yes. And you watch what God does because faith is the doorway to deliverance. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Give him a hand. God is so good. And we need to see... Again, the power of God that only comes through faith in the mighty power of God. Last scripture. This is my last scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'm sorry so many scriptures today, but I do got to get a five or six week baptismal thing in like, you know, 30 minutes. You know, just kidding. It says here, um, therefore... Okay. If anyone, are you in anyone? Who's in anyone? You, you're in anyone? I'm in anyone. Is in Christ. He is starting to change. Is that what it says? No, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the Bible says very clearly that we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. We just need to begin to believe, walk in it, and allow Christ to transform us from the inside out. Amen? God is good. So next Saturday at the picnic, we're going to be baptizing people and saying, maybe you've been water baptized before. You don't have to do it again, but you just really feel, hey, this message spoke to me. I'm going to go in by faith, believing that when I come up, I'm going to be free. Okay? And because some of you just, I've seen it so many times. If you have the right understanding, you, you can get it better results. Does that make sense, anybody? And so we're going to do that on Saturday. Okay? Um, and you who believe and you who are baptized will 
be saved. Amen. Why don't we stand together this morning? How many enjoyed that today? God's word is so amazing. I love it. Amen. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, that we don't, when we're baptized in water, we're not baptized into repentance because Jesus, you know, you took care of our sins as we've confessed them to you, but we're baptized into Christ and we raise in newness of life. And when we raise in newness of life, we, we have victory over the enemy in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to every heart in this place. Father, if there's anyone in this place who has not heard this message clearly or wants to come back to you and says, I, I believe in Christ. I believe he's the son of God. I want to confess my sin. Lord, that he'll make or she'll make that right with you today, God. And sign up for baptism on Saturday. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.